and and it's it's still quite shocking to me. Like even you know other scholars have that idea, right. um, you know that oh no, we should just give it all to the machines. You know, humans are just you know so full of unconscious bias that we can't you know debug them. So we can only debug the machines. But um, I'm like, well, who's creating the machine? So today we're speaking with Ifoma Ajunwa. Dr. Ajunwa is an associate professor at the Industrial and Labor Relations School at Cornell University and also an associated faculty member at Cornell Law School. In addition, she's a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and also a faculty affiliate at the Center for Inequality at Cornell University. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Ajunwa. We're very excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you spending the time. Thanks, David. All right, so um, we're going to jump right in uh, to an interesting and deep question uh, looking at employee surveillance. I know this is a topic that uh, you've spent some time, quite a bit of time thinking about and researching and is on a lot of people's mind with so much re remote work. One of the things we're interested in is how surveillance tools affect workers and what are the ways in which gender and race and other axes of inequality shape those effects? Well, thanks for that question, David. Um, surveillance uh, is something that has been around for as long as we've had the workplace. Uh, employers do have a vested interest in surveilling workers, uh, particularly in ensuring productivity and also in deterring misconduct. Um, however, the issue arises when you have a workplace um, where the surveillance becomes intrusive or pervasive. And also uh, surveillance operates on several axes uh, in ways that can be discriminatory or that can be used to single out um, certain employees for harassment. So we do need to be aware of that. Um, currently for American law, there are no limits really on uh, what can be uh, surveillance in the workplace. So for example, in my law review article, Limitless Worker Surveillance, I look at the various types of surveillance uh, currently employed in the workplace, whether it's surveillance of productivity or surveillance for healthy behaviors um, through workplace wellness programs. And I find that the law really essentially allows carte blanche uh, to the employer in terms of how far they can go in surveilling their employees. And while employers might think this is a boon or this is a benefit, uh, employers do really have to be careful in weighing the surveillance choices that they make to ensure that it does not then become uh, actionable against them or is not seen as uh, being discriminatory or harassment. And you know, to that effect, you know, I wanted to bring uh, a case that recently happened in the state of Georgia uh, to mind here. So this case was called the Divious Defecator uh, for reasons that will soon be, become clear. So in that case, um, cer certain people or individuals were leaving feces around the workplace, and this was a warehouse. And the employer, uh, to determine who was doing it, decided that they would surveil the workers through DNA testing. Um, unfortunately, they singled out two employees for this DNA testing, and those two employees happened to be African-American. Uh, so the DNA testing revealed that it was not the employees who were responsible for the acts uh, of vandalism, um, and those employees subs subsequently sued their employer. And uh, in a verdict returned against the employer, uh, the judge noted that this could be seen as harassment or discrimination because of the singling out of those two individuals. And that also, this was in violation of the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA. Uh, this is an interesting case for various reasons. Um, first, you know, you have to ask yourself, why use DNA testing? to uh, accomplish this surveillance? Could the employer not have used perhaps uh, video cameras, um, which is actually still perfectly legal? Um, and then the second interesting reason here is that ge the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act was not 
really uh, created for the purposes that it was used in this case. It was really created to prevent employers from discriminating against employees for hiring or retention purposes uh, because of their genetic profile. However, with this case, the court has now stretched GINA to in some ways be an anti-surveillance law when it comes to scrutinization of an employee's DNA profile. Wow, that's a that's a fascinating intersection of law and technology and and employees um, relationships with their with their employers. That's a, it's a that's a very unusual um, situation, but is it, it's a little unusual in the fact that um, companies. I think to some degree are aware that targeting and singling out people is dangerous from a legal perspective. And I wonder on the flip side, a lot of technology is sort of blanket. Um, right. And you're sort of casting a wide net that picks up uh, people, all, people and their activities uh, in a broad sense. And I wonder at the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, sort of what's, what's happening in that space where, where you know you may have software on your laptop if you you know sit at home and watch movies, et cetera, your employer is capturing everything about you, and we're sort of blanket capturing everything on that end of the spectrum um, you know there there's certainly dangers there right yeah, that's a great question because you know nowadays uh, surveillance is prevalent in the workplace, it is pervasive, it is widespread it's not really just a trend, it's really the standard right. Any American working today can really expect it, you know, can really expect that they will be surveilled in the workplace. Um, and, you know, you might think, well, if everybody is being surveilled, then, you know, it's going to affect everyone equally. But that's not really the case, right? Um, and let's, you know, let's take the employer perspective for, for a moment. So an employer might think, well, I'm surveilling all my employees equally. I'm not singling out anyone. Um, perhaps, um, you know, taking screenshots of their computers and what they're doing. Perhaps I'm taking, um, you know, transcripts of their emails. It's, it's equal for everyone. However, this can actually still be a situation of like more data, more problems <laughs> for the employer, because the more data you collect, right, the more you actually put yourself at risk of collecting data that is sensitive. Um, or data that is really forbidden in terms of making uh, employment decisions. Um, and this can then open up the employer to suits uh, by an employee who comes from a protected category, right? So for example, perhaps you, you have an employee who is not out in the workplace in terms of their sexual orientation, um, but the information from surveillance actually captures this or shows this. Um, if the employer then subsequently takes um, employment action against that employee, like let's say they're fired or let's say they're, um, you know, demoted or not promoted. Well, in, in such a situation, the employee could have reason to say, well, I suspect that it was because of my sexual orientation. And this claim would be bolstered, right, by the fact that the employee employer does actually have that information. So employers do really have to be, you know, sort of cognizant of those issues that come with more data. Um, well, just, uh, yeah, just kind of as a, a following up on that, I mean, it sounds like part of what you're saying is that some of the threat or risk around these surveillance tools and regimes is not just to the individual employee, right, in terms of kind of their privacy or their rights being violated, but also kind of an exposure of the employer to certain kinds of legal risks, right? There's some threats there, and that's sort of why it's important for employers and organizations to be thoughtful about it, not just, you know, in service of kind of doing the right thing by their employees, but also just being cognizant of the risk that they're exposing themselves to. Seems right. like part of what you're saying. Right, right. So, so I really see the risks of surveillance as twofold, right? Um, there's certainly the, the risk to the individual employee, right? Invasions of their privacy, um, information about them being revealed without their consent, and perhaps that information then being used to treat them differently. Um, you know, you can think of, for, for example, um, you know, women with children who perhaps prefer not to make that known in the workplace, but through surveillance of the emails or even through uh, surveillance of the screenshots of the computer that becomes known. 
And this could in turn impact, say, their promotion chances or their um, ascension to leadership positions, correct? Um, but on the flip side, there is also a risk to the employer of uh, pervasive surveillance because they now have, you know, within their knowledge or within their possession, information um, that is uh, pointing to protected categories, right? And just the mere fact of having that information puts them at greater risk for lawsuits, uh, you know, alleging discrimination. And I, I wonder, it just makes me wonder about kind of what we're dealing with right now with the remote work during the pandemic. I mean, I feel as though I'm reading articles all the time, right, about an increase in these surveillance tools and employers tracking employees. Um, and I don't quite, it's not quite clear to me sort of what is the prevalence um, of that, you know, how much that has increased, but I would be really curious to hear your thoughts, A, on just, you know, do you, is your sense that there are more um, intrusive or pervasive um, tools that are being used? And also kind of, you know, to this point about the risk for employers, what would you advise organizations that are, you know, thinking, oh, we need to maybe um, more proactively monitor our employees if they're working from home? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, there certainly is an instinct, right, to surveil workers who are working from home. Um, employers might have some anxiety in terms of maintaining productivity um, or even just deterring uh, misconduct. And we have seen some high profile cases of misconduct happening with employ employees working from home. Uh, that being said, um, I think employers really need to be very deliberate and really need to be very uh, sort of um, conscientious in terms of the sort of surveillance tools that they are choosing and think about whether these are serving the purpose that they want them to serve or whether those surveillance tools are too invasive uh, and too sort of um, infringing upon the dignity and privacy of workers. Because he, there's another layer, right, that has been brought on by this uh, COVID-19 crisis, which is that most employees are not working from home, right? So there is a difference, you know, in terms of surveilling a worker in the workplace versus surveilling a worker in their actual home. Um, and employers do really have to give some thought to that. I wonder, um, we've been talking a lot about how employers think about this. I wonder, um, for the people watching this, how employees should be thinking about this in terms of one, like what you said, Dave, most of what we're doing is over video. Mm -hmm. um, most of what you can see are people, not just maybe the person. Um, I know a lot of cats show up, but also children. Right. Um, and I wonder, do you have any advice for employees or do you have a sense of whether employees realize this or should be more aware? Well, I think it really behooves employees to really be very careful uh, when conducting work um, at home. Um, and I would really urge uh, any employee to really treat their work hours um, as that, work hours, and to really um, be conscientious in terms of like, the activities that they're doing during their work hours. Uh, I would say really try to have a dedicated laptop for your work. Um, and obviously don't do personal activities on that laptop. Um, I would say try, to, if you can afford it, have a dedicated space uh, where you work um, that is hopefully uh, a place that can um, be secluded where you can close a door and it can be quiet and you can sort of shut out distractions. Um, I would just really urge employees to really understand that with the advent of, of technologies now, anything you do on an employee um, laptop, like if an employer gives you a laptop or if an employer gives you any kind of electronic device, the law is that that device actually still belongs to the employer, such that they can surveil anything on it. So it is important for employees to realize that when they are using those devices. Um, and it is important for employees to really be professional during your work hours and try very uh, hard to keep their life, uh, personal life separate, separate from their work life.
So shifting gears to kind of thinking in another way um, about um, about you know how employers use technology. You've studied um, the use of these artificial intelligence hiring tools um, and screening tools, um, which, as you um, have said, you know often they're they're created or they're implemented ostensibly with the purpose to reduce bias, right? They're kind of an approach as an intervention to either eliminate or mitigate human bias. I think most people, you know, who kind of just even casually keep up with news about technology um, and, and business know that that's very much not the case um, all the time and often can just perpetuate bias. Um, so just, and I know this is a long-winded sort of in, intro, introduction, but would love to just hear you talk a little bit about your work on this sort of, you know, how how is it that these algorithmic hiring tools can perpetuate inequalities? Just maybe some examples um, um, of, of what you see in that space. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when it comes to automated hiring, I would say that the public impression and, and also the ethos behind why employers adopt them is that they're seen as impartial, they're seen as neutral, they're seen as having less bias, right, than human decision making. So in my paper, The Paradox of Automation as Anti-Bias Intervention, I really examine this, right? I really examine this idea that automated hiring platforms are neutral or without bias and can actually be sort of an intervention to prevent bias in coming into the hiring process. And what I find is that this is not actually the reality, right? And don't get me wrong, I think automated hiring as a technological tool can be quite useful, but just like any technological tool, um, automated hiring will perform the way that the people who use it um, make it perform, right? So the people who use automated hiring are ultimately uh, the people who will dictate the results. And what I mean by that is that there is a false binary between automated decision making and human decision making. And that's because we don't have the singularity, right? We don't really have humans who are completely, I'm sorry, we don't have uh, machines that are completely thinking on their own, right? All the algorithms we have right now are created by humans. Yes, we have machine learning algorithms that learn from the initial program and then create new programs, but you still have to understand that there is an initial program there. And then there is a training of the algorithm created and this is trained on data um, that a human decision maker decides should be the training data. And this training data can come with its own um, historically embedded bias. Um, and just to give you an, a real life example of this, um, there was uh, a news article uh, really of a whistleblower exposing that Amazon had created an automated hiring program um, really for the purpose of actually finding more women um, for its uh, engineer positions, you know, computer science and engineering positions. And it turned out that that um, automated hiring program or platform was actually biased against women. And Amazon subsequently had to scrape that program. And of course, you know, didn't really reveal it to the public. Uh, well, the question then became, well, how could this be? how could a program that was actually created to help women, right, that was actually created to ameliorate this bias against women, how could that program then actually go, go ahead and replicate that bias? Um, and that is, you know, an important point that I make in my article, Paradox of Automation as Anti-Bias Intervention, which is that automated hiring platforms, right, if not, you know, program correctly, if care is not taken, can actually serve to replicate bias. And while doing so at large scale, can also serve to obfuscate, right? It can actually serve to hide that this bias is, ha is happening. So it's not enough for an employer to say, I want a more diverse workplace, or um, I am going to use automated hiring and therefore eliminate human bias, um, the employer actually should do audits of the results coming out of its automated hiring because those audits are what will tell it 
if it has an issue with its automated hiring platform. So I advocate in my um, forthcoming paper, automated employment decision, um, automated um, employment discrimination, I, I advocate that there should be an auditing imperative for automated hiring systems. Because why should we have an automated hiring system, some of which can be machine learning, and just depend on them to get a good results without actually checking for it? So I argue that the federal government should actually mandate that automated hiring platforms be designed in such a way to allow easy audits. So the design features can incorporate already um, elements that would allow for like audits to be run in like one hour or less, right? Because these are computerized systems. So it wouldn't really be a big burden on the employer then. Um, and you know, I wanna add one other thing to that end. Some employers take this tack of, you know, look for no evil, see no evil, hear no evil, right? Like they don't want to do the audits because they are afraid of finding discrimination. And then, you know, then we actually have to do something about it. That's not actually a good tack to take in this day and age. Why? Because a recent decision um, actually has now allowed for academic researchers to audit systems. Um, so whether an employer wants it or not, right, an academic researcher could come about and audit their system, and guess what? Now they're caught, you know, unawares. So it is actually better for the employer to take this responsibility of auditing their system regularly, checking for bias, and then also correcting for that bias. I found what you said about this, how we set up this false binary between human and machine decision making really useful because you know in kind of the like I said sort of general you know diversity equity inclusion field there's you know a lot of discussion about how it's very hard to um, for people to unlearn bias or to de-bias a person so we need to focus on processes and systems which I think there's a lot of you know merit to that but I get uncomfortable sometimes with this sort of pivot to well if we just have the right technologies and tools then that's the solution and, and I, I think what you said that's just a very helpful way for me to, you know, just, I think I'll be relying on that to articulate that concern to say, well, you know, these are not, you know, human and machine decision making are not these two independent things. Yeah, and, and it's, it's still quite shocking to me, like, even, you know, other scholars have that idea, right. um, you know, that, oh, no, we should just give it all to the machines, you know, humans are just, you know, so full of unconscious bias that we can't, you know, debug them, so we can only debug the machines. But um, I'm like, well, who's creating the machine? Exactly, but I think, I mean, that is, just, I think, yeah, there's a strong trend for that, and especially in kind of behavioral science driven, you know, right. on discrimination in the workplace. Those are really good examples. Um, they're started, you're starting to share examples of how technology can be perfected to actually reduce bias. Um, right. Are there other ways you know of or, or have come across um, where we can actually leverage technology to fight bias? Right. So, so you know, I think a, a lot of times the perception is that people like me are Cassandras, right? Because we are always predicting doom and gloom when you use technology. And, you know, many people see technology as like panaceas. There is this, you know, brand new um, shiny tool and they want to just be able to use it and not really have to worry about consequences. Um, so I don't think I'm a technology pessimist, um, but I'm also not necessarily a blind-eyed uh, technology optimist. Um, I think I'm somewhere in between, which is technological tools are just that, tools. Um, the results from them will depend on how you use them. I think technology can be a boon for employers who are trying to do the right thing and diversify their workplaces. I think technology could also be a boon for employees who are trying to get you know, a foothold in the workplace, trying to find employment. But I do think for that to happen, we need regulation of technologies. Uh, technology uh, makers can't really just be allowed to um, have like, you know, we can't really take a laser fair approach 
to the de development of automated decision-making technologies, right? We need strong regulation um, to make sure that they are serving the good of society. Um, in automated hiring specifically, I think automated hiring with the proper regulations could actually be a boon to uh, anti-discrimination efforts. Because for one, if you have a data retention mandate, right, and a record keeping design, then through automated hiring, you could actually see exactly who is applying, right, and exactly who is getting the job. So there could actually then be very accurate records of the picture, right, of the employment decision making picture, such that you could then see if there is bias, right? You could then see if there is employment discrimination. And I think, frankly, the first step to fixing the problem is seeing the problem. And I think with um, traditional hiring, a lot of times the problem is quite hidden. It's not as easy to see the bias. It's not as easy to see the discrimination. Whereas with automated hiring, it could actually become easier to see all of that. Yeah, it's, it's a good point that with, um, with automated hiring systems and the appropriate audit tools, you could actually see the scoring right. of right. factors like you mentioned, maybe um, right. um, predominantly uh, for women's uh, universities or higher ed. Whereas with uh, hiring managers, that's hidden away in someone's head and they may not even know why they're making that decision. That's a, exactly. that's a great point. Exactly. As we say, you know, in the AI field, the worst uh, black box is the human mind. Uh, that's uncrackable, right, to some extent. So maybe we could talk a little bit about wearable tech and mm -hmm. the implications for employees and employers. Uh, I know uh, in some of your writing, some of your research, you've uh, had examples that affect people of different gender differently, but then also um, some of this technology is getting quite invasive. What can you share about this topic? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we've had so many technological advances in the past, um, I would say, a few decades. Um, and one of the biggest ones is really this uh, rise of wearable tech, because as computer systems become smaller and smaller, um, then we're more able to embed tech in so many different things. And wearable tech is is definitely become uh, more even more than a trend now. I would say it's become really a fixture of the workplace. And you know, when I speak about wearable tech, um, probably the first one that comes to mind for most people is the Fitbit. You know, that you're wearing on your wrist. Um, um, there's also rings um, that do similar things to the Fitbits, like track your heart rate, um, you know, pace, etc. Um, but there's actually a plethora of, you know, types of wearable techs. What I am seeing, though, is that these wearable tech are also raising several legal questions. Um, the first one is really related to data ownership and control. Um, so there's this idea of that these wearable tech are collecting so much data from employees. And there's a question of, well, who owns the data, right? The device belongs to the employer, but the data is being gener generated by the employee. So should the employer own the data? Um, even if the employer owns the data, who has access to the data, right? Um, should the employee have access to the data to actually review it and make sure it's accurate? Um, and should they have, you know, some say over how that data is used? Um, so I wrote a, an article for Harvard Business Review where I actually, you know, noted that currently all the data that's being collected as part of workplace wellness programs, you know, through wearable tech can actually be sold without the knowledge or consent of the worker uh, and has been, you know, in, you know, currently and in the past. So is, should that be legal? Um, should employees have a say in how their data is exported and, and exploited? Um, and then, you know, when you come to workplace wellness programs, you know, you have the wearable tech like Fitbits, but you also have other apps that workers are being asked to download on their phones um, to track um, their health habits. And unfortunately, some of those apps have actually been found to be doing things that could be used for discrimination or for discriminatory purposes. 
So there was an article in the New York Times Law Review where Castlight, um, a workplace wellness vendor, had um, you know requested that employees uh, download an app to track their prescription medicine usage. Um, and they were using this information essentially to figure out when a woman was about to get pregnant. And, you know, basically what that means is that, you know, certain prescriptions, right, are counterindicated for when somebody is either pregnant or about to get pregnant. So those women would then stop taking those prescriptions. And, um, you know, Castlight was using that to predict when a woman was about to get pregnant. Uh, this was especially concerning because although we have the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, um, which forbids employers from discriminating against women who are pregnant, notice the act does not forbid employers from discriminating against women who are about to get pregnant. So essentially this act could, was a tool, right, that could allow employers to really discriminate against women who were about to get pregnant without legal recourse. So that is concerning um, when wearable tech is used for those purposes. Th thank you for, no, thank you. That's that's really good. Um, I can see from Colleen's face, she has given up on all of humanity, especially the technology. <laughs> I know some of your work has certainly looked at surveillance and you've, um, I know you have other scholars you uh, either collaborate right. with or respect in the field. Uh, tell us about some of that. Right. Um, so I definitely want to mention the work of Ethan Bernstein here. Um, he is a Harvard business professor who has done empirical work uh, looking at surveillance in the workplace. Um, he's looked at surveillance in um, factories in China and other places. Um, and I, I want to highlight one important finding of his, which I think is something that definitely employers need to keep in mind. So in one of his papers, he noted that when um, workers were overly surveilled, right? It actually backfired. So it actually had the opposite effect that employers wanted. So he found that, you know, in one specific factory, right? When um, workers felt that they were being overly surveilled, yes, they did work exactly how they were expected to do them, but they didn't actually take initiative right? They didn't actually get creative in terms of getting things done in ways that were faster and more productive. Um, so I think employees really need to think about the fact that, you know, organizational theory has recognized something called practical drift, which is that in any given work, right, there's um, sort of a, a standard way of getting it done, right? And this standard way has really been thought of by management, right? But the people on the ground, the people who are doing the actual work, they sometimes quickly figure out that, yes, the standard way is okay, but there are actually better or quicker or faster or more efficient ways to get the stuff done. And so they, they drift away, right, from the standard way of doing things. And this is called practical drift. But when you have over surveillance, then you're not allowing for this practical drift from workers. And then you're actually basically, uh, you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face, as they say, right? You're actually hamstringing your uh, employees um, from being able to be as efficient as possible. So we um, often end these interviews with sort of asking the person to, you know, recommend a resource or a takeaway for people who care about these topics. Um, so we want to do that slightly differently since you have this forthcoming book um, that certainly is going to be a resource for people who care about these issues. So um, you have this a book coming out next year, I believe, in 2021 um, called The Quantified Worker. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're in the home stretch with writing and editing and yeah. all of that. Um, so it's, your book is called The Quantified Worker. And so we're just love for you to talk a bit about the focus of that book and, and also kind of to this point about creating change, you know, who you hope will read it and what, what impact you're hoping to have with, with the book. Right. So my book, The Quantified Worker, um, is really a, a historical legal um, overview or review of all the technology uh, that is now sort of remaking the workplace. And the focus is on AI technologies. Um, and really examining how those technologies are changing the employer-employee relationship 
and whether we can ensure through uh, new legal regimes, uh, through new legal regulations, that those technologies actually um, don't change um, the workplace for the worse, but actually can change the workplace for the better. Um, so my, my hope is that my book will actually be read um, not just by business leaders or um, HR people, but also by, you know, employees, by definitely by lawmakers, uh, really just to get an in-depth look at what these technologies are doing in the workplace. Because I think a lot of times we hear about these technologies, but without having experienced them firsthand, we're not really actually aware of the impact that they are having on the individual worker. Uh, we're not aware of the impact that they are having on society. So my book um, will include, you know, historical accounts of the evolution of these technologies just to really understand where they came from and therefore the sort of ethos behind them. I'll also include um, some interviews of people who have encountered these technologies and their experience with them. And then finally, I will have proposals um, for legal changes, um, new laws um, for how to better uh, incorporate these uh, tools in the workplace because you know, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. I think these technologies are definitely here to stay, um, but it is about making sure that they are operating in a way that is respecting human autonomy, right? Uh, operating in a way that is respecting um, our societal ideals of equal opportunity for everyone and also inclusion of everyone regardless of, you know, disability, uh, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation. So, so that, that's really what I hope to do with the book. Sounds like a fantastic text. Very, yes. very valuable. We want to thank Dr. Junwa for taking her time today to be with us. That's a wrap on the interview, but the conversation continues. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Ajunwa. This has been a really fascinating conversation. And we want to hear from all of you watching. So please send us your comments, suggestions, and ideas, questions to justdigital at hbs.edu. You've been watching Pathways to a Just Digital Future. An investigative project that aims to better understand and address inequality in tech. This program was produced by the Harvard Business School Digital and Gender Initiatives. Our team includes Ethiopia Almaty and my cat, Tanya Flint. One more time, Liz Sarley. Thomas Jamie Dayo. I'm Dave Homa. And I'm Colleen Ammerman. Thanks for hanging out with us. Keep exploring at justdigital.hbs.edu.